first thing I'd like to, um, to say, and to put all of our minds at rest, and to particularly welcome anybody of the male gender in the room, is that when we talk about gender, we mean all of us. And uh, I love this slide from Fawema, um, the partner organisation that we have in Malawi, which shows their membership. Um, this organisation is all about women, and it's all about, it's a, it's a voluntary membership organisation. And this slide shows that uh, men are uh, you know, well involved, I think in the North, even equally involved um, in the work that Fawema does. Um, so um, that's important for us all to remember. Um, we might therefore question sometimes whether it's appropriate or useful to talk about women and girls in, in terms of achievement. Um, the project that we have in Malawi has just been awarded as one of the top 50 ideas and solutions for improving the lives of girls and women worldwide. And we're delighted about that, and our partner in, in Malawi is obviously delighted about that as well. Um, but one thing for us to think about is whether it's a double-edged sword to, to talk about women and girls separately, to give rewards separately, whether um, in some senses that makes people switch off or think, um, or think that women and girls have to be treated separately because their level of achievement is, is different somehow. That's just something for us to keep in mind. Um, before we go any further, I do want to bring greetings and apologies from Kenya <coughs> Kachigunda, who is the chair of Fawema. She was so excited to be coming here. She was particularly excited um, that she was going to get a chance to visit the original Blunt Tire, um, which uh, we'll have to make possible for her at another time. Um, but she does bring her very warm greetings and apologies. Um, the vision of Fawema is uh, inspired by the Millennium Development Goal for Gender Equality. At least I think it was that way around, or perhaps the NDG was inspired by Fawema, I'm not sure. Um, but as we know, most of the MDGs are, are not on track uh, to achieve what they set out to achieve by 2015. And um, the one for gender equality in particular um, has been criticised by some people for being over ambitious, perhaps not addressing the complexities of gender inequality um, or the diverse forms that gender inequality takes. Some of those concerns might be valid. But the inclusion of this MDG has at the very least opened a debate about gender um, and gives us an opportunity to think more widely about the universal right to education, what that means and what it means for girls and women. There are very valid arguments to support equity in education from the rationale of both social and economic development, as well as obviously from the, from the point of view of universal rights. There's also increasing recognition of the significance of gender equality in education in relation to well-being, in relation to women's capacity to develop their identity and to achieve in other areas. And I hope that this morning we can just raise some of those um, ideas and put some thoughts in our heads that we can perhaps explore in more detail as we go through the day. So the first thing um, to think about um, is access. Whichever statistic we look at, whether it's the number of girls um, out of school compared to boys, whether it's the numbers who drop out, the numbers who complete the primary school, secondary school, number of girls who get to go to university, who qualify in professions, who become high achievers. In every case, girls and women come out worse than their male counterparts. And the differences become wider the further along the educational journey that you go. The last time I was in Malawi, I met a woman who was the first woman to, to ever to go to university from her district. Um, I, I found that shocking, but that's the reality. That is still the reality in 2012, that um, there is such inequity of opportunity and access. So the challenge for us in the countries where we work is to do everything possible in terms of policy, physical school structures, funding and social messages to create equal access and opportunity for all children. We might then um, look um, at quality as it goes hand in hand with access, as Sam has already emphasised. Um, another useful way to look at it is content. It's not just about getting girls into school, it's about what happens when they're there. We all, whatever our gender, treat girls and women differently to boys and men and expect different things of them. Content of education matters. One of my colleagues, one of our colleagues at the OU, has carried out extensive research into girls and boys' education in the UK. 
In one example, where girls and boys were taught separately for science, a teacher led an exercise to design an apparatus to move an object five meters. And there were some sort of guidelines on how to do that. When he addressed the boys, he was very clear on the brief. And in the way he talked, it was very clear that he expected them to be able to achieve the objective. When he spoke to the girls, even though when he fed back, he didn't realize that he was um, using any, any different approach. He did use different language. He told them not to worry if they couldn't do it and just to do what they could. The boys in that experiment performed largely to task. The girls appeared to aim lower and focus more on the visual aspects than the functional ones. Gender operates at a number of levels, and, and one of those is assessment. In another observation, in a maths assessment, it was observed that the, the girls were hesitant to answer questions about cars, even though the question was about pie charts, which they had confidently used in other situations. And the boys, um, on the other hand, were very hesitant in answering maths questions which related to women's clothes. So um, the, the important thing to think about is that when we are modeling delivery of education, we are all products of our culture and our experience, and it affects the way we experience and benefit from education. So a consideration of culture has to be part of our practice in curriculum design, in teacher training and professional development, in teacher allocation, and in, in assessment. And Laurie's going to um, talk about some of the cultural issues that we've um, come across in um, our project in Malawi. Yes, I'm just back from Malawi and one of the aspects we were talking with, the project we have in Malawi is using some experienced teachers, both primary school teachers and secondary school teachers to support women who want to go into teacher training. So we were working with uh, experienced primary teachers and they were telling us the difficulties some of the women were having in terms of being part of our project. And some of them are to do with social and cultural issues and very often the perceptions of the families they are coming from. One of them was saying that her husband wouldn't allow her to study in the house, in the house where they lived. So she had to take her books outside to study. And because she was part of this project, which does, which does give them a very, very small financial support option, he was saying, well, you have money, so with the money you are getting from this project, you just buy all the food for the family. And I am not giving you money to support families. So these aspects are aspects that are affecting women to get into education. Another, one, another example they gave us also was coming from the parents, where one of the girls in our project, her parents, because again she was getting a small uh, financial support aspect, her parents just told her, well, you're receiving money, the children in the school are calling, in the street, in the community, are calling you madam. So you are a teacher. So with the money you get, you're going to go and live on your own and live on yourself. So the teachers have to do some work with the community, with the chiefs in the community, with the parents, the husbands of these women, to try and encourage them to continue the project and to continue in education. And this is very much linked with what Sam was saying before in terms of working with the communities and the wider uh, circles around women in these aspects. Um, just a couple more um, points. Just finally, I just wanted to um, talk about identity um, because it's very caught up in, in uh, education and, and how women and girls um, experience education and their ambitions. Um, so in this particular project, we're trying to track how the self-identity of the scholars changes during the project. Um, some of, this is one of the, the scholars um, who is, so she's recently left um, secondary school but wants to retake and has aspirations to become a teacher. Um, and so she's now on, on that trajectory that perhaps she was on when she was younger, she fell off and now she's back on there. But some of the women have been saying, oh, I'm not confident enough to be a teacher. But as they start to work alongside somebody else in the classroom, they begin to gain that confidence. In some of the situations where we all work, we may find that we're asking and inviting women to adopt new roles with them, we are pushing the boundaries of the existing paradigms. And this will always be the case when we're trying to achieve equity, but it shouldn't put us off. Um, 
again, when we talk about identity, role models are crucial um, in enabling people to achieve their potential and to envisage what that potential might be. So I mustn't finish without um, uh, doing Virginia again another favour by saying thank you very much um, for this conference. She's very excited to see um, the presentations that we're going to, to send on to her um, from all of you. So thank you very much and Sekoma Kongwiri.